If you have the ability to stand up, I would love it if you could stand up and we're going to read together from James chapter 5. We're finishing off our series today in James. Um, We're going to read the last little bit of James chapter 5, starting from verse 13. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. Um, It says this. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sin to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you is if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wanderings will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Just a little reading, but we need God's help as we think through the implications of this. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, uh, this, this is your word comes from you, and and you are the source of life and truth and grace, and we need all of that this morning as we reflect on it. So Spirit, will you um, shine your light into the Word and help us to hear firstly and obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a seat. All right, let's just jump straight into this because it's just a short passage, but there's actually quite a lot that we want to cover um, because there are some pretty... Uh, you, you can read over this stuff pretty easily, but, but there's some pretty big, big things in here, big statements that we want to sort of try and grapple with. So this is the first thing that I want you to notice about this passage as we talk about prayer. I hope you notice that there's a lot about prayer in that passage, and that's what we're focusing on as we finish off this series in James, about an authentic type of faith, a fair income type of faith. And I focused it on... Um, an old saying that I'm not sure you've heard, I've heard it plenty of times, people saying, hey, they, they find out I'm a Christian. And I was working in mining or I was working wherever I was at the time and someone says, oh, you're a Christian and you know, I was working in the church at the same time. It's, oh, well, you know, when you're next talking to the bloke upstairs, put in a good word for me type of thing, you know, and that old um, Oka saying. So we're going to be talking a bit about prayer. All right, point number one, though, um, that I want you to focus in on is just verse 13. So just find it again in your Bibles. Um, and the, the, the phrase that I've given here is prayer as a posture of focused attention. And let me explain what I mean by that. Prayer as a posture of focused attention. Uh, but verse 13 says this, just so that it's, it's fresh in your memory. Is anyone among you suffering? Uh, question. Now, it's you know, potentially rhetorical as we read this through, sort of like you're not meant to sort of stand up right now and go, that's me, Chris, I'm suffering. But we could ask it like that, couldn't we? I could say to you right now, show of hands, um, is anyone among you suffering? Now, suffering's a bit of a spectrum. Yeah? There's a few people that went... Um, and one of the reasons why we're probably not so upfront about how we, how we share that is because we, ver- we realise that there's such a spectrum of suffering, isn't there? Um, there are people who have loved ones right now getting angiograms. The, 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 the health of their heart is in question. That's suffering. Um, there are people who are facing uncertain futures because of diagnostic you know, results they've got back about their health. That, there's suffering. There are people who have loved ones that they're separated from for all sorts of reasons. They're suffering. There's all different types of suffering. Suffering that we think is 
severe, suffering that we think is, you know, it's hard, but it's not, not death. Um, but the question is, is anyone among you suffering? And James says, let him pray. Let, let that person pray. If you're suffering, pray. And then, by contrast, there's another question. Is anyone cheerful? Which I think is an, an interesting way of contrasting two experiences. Suffering, cheerfulness. I wouldn't necessarily put those two against each other all the time. But James does. And what does James say? Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Okay, so we're just going to focus on 13 for a moment. Is anyone among you suffering? Is anyone cheerful? I would say that those two questions, to a good chance, probably cover the spectrum of everyone sitting in the room today, watching online, if you are. Um, There are those amongst us suffering. There are those amongst us cheerful to some degree. James says, if you're suffering, pray. If you're cheerful, praise. What I want you to notice, though, is that both of those um, descriptions, suffering and cheerfulness, are descriptions of an external circumstance. They aren't from outside of us. Suffering and cheerfulness are a disposition. They're they're a state of existing in this world. They're an internal state of engaging in the world around us. Now, they're usually in response. They're usually connected to something external. Something outside of us happened, and it caused us to feel Grief, or it caused us to experience some type of suffering in some way, or something amazing and good is happening in our life, and we just can't help but walk around. You know, our our fiance is about to uh, arrive, and I'm getting married on Friday, and we're walking around. Obviously, he's got this big smile on his face over there. You know, so he's cheerful. We also know that we are complex human beings, and it's quite possible to be suffering and experience cheerfulness almost simultaneously at times, right? So I've been at a funeral and found myself giggling with a friend, trying to, this is not, a right, this is not the right place to get the giggles, right? Because um, my friend and I that were there, we were remembering good times that we had with the person who had died, and we started laughing about it. We're suffering and we're grieving and we're laughing and we're complex beings, right? What I want you to note is that prayer and praise in this situation is about where our focus is. How do we respond when we're suffering? How do we respond when we're cheerful? James says that whether you are suffering or whether you are cheerful, our focus remains the same. An authentic faith, a fair dinkum faith, has a posture, a position of focused attention on God. Are you suffering? The question is, then pray. Right? That's, that's a, a, a response to our suffering where internally I'm feeling broken, internally I'm feeling fr- afraid or, or grief or whatever it is that's causing us pain, maybe that's causing us some form of suffering. And James says, then your focus, now, let me just test this theory because it's been true in my life and by what I've observed. When I'm suffering, my attention and my focus generally starts to turn inward, Right? Why am I suffering? And my focus starts to become inward. I start to try and figure out the cause of my suffering. I start to try and figure out where my suffering has come come from. So my focus starts to turn inward. In its worst case scenario, I start to get into that form of sort of woe is me. I'm suffering. Nobody understands my suffering like, like I do, you know. No one can understand how I'm feeling. And and my my focus starts to draw inward. James says, when you're suffering, focus starts to shift outward. Pray. That's what prayer is. 
I love the fact, Mark, that you introduced this by sort of saying that we have a living saviour, a living God. Uh, it's not just an idea. God's not just an idea. He's not just a construct or a, a faith system or he, he's definitely not some worthless stone idol somewhere. We have a living saviour, a God who reigns eternally, who walks and makes his home amongst us. And James says when you're suffering, your focus and your attention shifts towards him and you, you enter into dialogue. That's what prayer is. You're entering into conversation. You're entering into a, a sense of saying, hey, my focus and my attention and my words, they are going towards God. An authentic faith has a posture of focused attention on God. And so are we suffering? Then we pray. Are we cheerful? Right? Then we sing. We sing praise, he says. Praise is another form of prayer. Where we say to God, God, this is what I think about you. You're amazing. This, this is the way that I've experienced you. You're so good. Now, the old adage, I think, is reasonably true. Prayer is difficult. I'm not sure about your experience if you're a Christian here today, if you've walked with Jesus. Prayer seems like the most simple thing in the world. And yet, as a discipline of Christian life, I would say it's been one of the things that I know I've struggled with. So many other people that I know, you know, as we've talked about it over the years, have said, oh, why, Chris, why is it so hard to pray? Why is it so hard? This, this prayer life is such a, such a challenge for me. Another, it's another form of focusing our attention on God when things are going good in our life. Because generally, when things are going bad in our life, it's not as difficult to pray. That's when you sort of go, oh, God, things are falling apart. And if you can come in and help me, you know, we start making these little plea bargains with God. Um, if you do this, then I'll do that and all that sort of stuff. You know, it's, we, we do this sort of thing when our life is hitting rock solid, uh, rock, rock bottom. You know, we, we start going, wow, I, now I'm going to call out to God because I'm desperate. But when things are going well in my life, that's when I tend just to sort of think, well, somehow I've done this. <laughs> I've made things go well in my life. So I'm... I forget to call out to God about it. But James says, if anyone among you suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him praise. Both of those are an expression of an outward focus, a focused attention on who God is and, and what he's doing in our life. Either in desperation as I'm calling out to him about the suffering and, and what I'm experiencing or in praise and whether that's through song or through hymns of praise or, or psalms of praise or just my own you know, attempt to sort of extol the name of God, then I'm praising because I'm, I'm cheerful. I'm, I'm so happy about what's happening in my life right now. So the first thing I want you to notice is prayer as a posture of focused attention. Okay, next thing. Verses 14 to verse 15, we're going to look at prayer in response to sickness. And this gets challenging. Prayer in response to sickness. Uh, th this is a tough one. This is a real tough one. And I say that because there are faces missing from this family that, that we have prayed earnestly for, aren't there? Where, where we've had emergency prayer gatherings at 10 o'clock at night or all, all sorts of things. And, and we have prayed as, as churches earnestly for people that we have loved. And we look around and their faces are no longer with us. And the question that we ask ourselves is, did we not have enough faith? Maybe that's the question you've asked yourself. It's the question I have over time about my own life. But on the flip side of that, I look around this room this morning, I also see faces here, faces that we had in mind as we prayed through tears in desperation for God to act, who God has granted us the blessing of going on seeing. Our prayers were answered in the way that we wanted them to be answered. <laughs> 
And the question then remains, were our prayers for them somehow better? Did we pray somehow better for those people than we did for the people who died? They're difficult questions to wrestle with. And I know that we have a lot of, in this room even, we have a lot of strong emotions attached to the memories of people that we've loved and lost. But I I want to try and handle these verses as honestly and as open as I can. The context here is sickness within the body of Christ. Right? Sickness within the local church. There are people who are sick. That's the question that's asked, right? Is anyone among you sick? So go back and have a look at the text again. We'll just remind ourselves about what it says. Verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? A bit like, is anyone among you suffering? Is anyone among you cheerful? Now he says, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So I want to be clear um, with what we practice in in this church and, and why we do it that way. I realise that other churches or maybe you've got previous experience elsewhere may have demonstrated something different to you. Um, I'm not here to critique that necessarily. I simply want to set up or or help you see a set of realistic expectations about what we do here at Raymond Terrace Community Church. So if you are sick, if you are suffering in the form of sickness, then have a look at what you could expect. Uh, Verse 13 initially, told us that if you're suffering, then pray. Uh, We would hope that if you're experiencing sickness in some form, in your own experience, your own life, that um, you would be praying, right? You'd be praying. And in fact, you'd be asking people who are close to you, uh, your friends in this church, maybe you're a part of a core group, you'd be sharing with your core group, hey, I'm experiencing this um, sickness, can you be praying with me? And you would be praying. So you would share your concerns and you would have other people pray. We're going to get to uh, a bit later in this passage, verse 16. We're going to talk a bit about the the responsibility that we have to each other um, in this. So I'll leave that till then. But you would be sharing your concerns and having other people pray with you. And then thirdly, verse 14 is very clear. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. So request the elders to come and pray over you in the name of the Lord is what we we practice this, right? So uh, one little thing, notice that the word elders there is plural, which means that while we believe that some individuals um, may have a unique spiritual gift of healing or maybe God gives this unique um, ability or or spiritual gift on on occasions, In general, we would see this as being the exceptional experience, not necessarily the normal experience. And so having a group of your shepherds, your elders, isn't about sort of supercharging the prayer through multiplication. It's not sort of like, well, if I've got one person praying, it's going to be better if I have at least three, four or five, right? We're going to sort of multiply this prayer up a little bit. Um, that's, That's not what it means, It simply demonstrates that there's a group of shepherds who are normal people who are caring for their flock by coming beside them when they're hurting and then carrying the hurting into the throne room of heaven through prayer. That's what praying for somebody else is doing. You ever realize that? Intercessory prayer, when you pray for somebody else, it's kind of like picking them up and carrying them on their behalf into the throne room of heaven and imploring with your father for this person that you've just brought in. Right? And, and when you're sick, it says, James says, call the elders of the church, the shepherds of the church, who'll come, come around you, and it's like figuratively picking up the, the little sick lamb and bringing it to the great shepherd and saying, can you Can you help? We know, as a group of elders in this church, we know that we bring no special ability to heal. Normally. Normally. 
but in complete dependence on God who can and does heal, we love to come alongside those of you who are experiencing suffering, especially through sickness, and just to come around you and pray with you, to pray over you, to implore our Father, can you please help? If you were to ask us to come and pray over you, um, when we do so, we will come and we will pray. We're not going to come and ask to read your medical reports. We're not going to come and say, can we please check that this sickness is... We just come and we just pray, right? Um, We will ask your permission to anoint you with oil. That's what James says to do. Did you see that in verse 14? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. We'll ask your permission, just in case you have some sort of, you know, skin allergy to oil or something. I don't know. We'll just say, hey, we're not going to walk in and just like throw oil at you. We'll we'll say, is it okay if we just anoint you with oil um, as we pray? It will just be plain old olive oil, usually. Um, Maybe sunflower oil. Potentially whatever's on special at the moment, but um, it will just be plain old olive oil. It will not be imported oil harvested from an ancient tree growing on the eastern slopes of Mount Zion. It won't be oil blessed by some secret order of priests descended from the unbroken line of Aaron, purified by straining it through a small piece of the Shroud of Turin, and then submerged seven times into the Jordan, packaged in a 10 mil vial, purchased for $199 from (laughs) unleashyourhealing.com or spiritualrelics.com, but there's a good chance it will be cold pressed and extra virgin. Um, My point is that oil is not the point. The oil isn't some supernatural or magical healing element. Now, I know that oil historically has seemed to have some medicinal value, but we're not, we're not there to try and attempt to cure your sickness by oil. Anointing with oil in the biblical context is a practice that symbolizes being set apart for some particular work of God. That's what oil has always meant. Being anointed with oil has always meant that in the scriptures. A symbol of being set apart for a particular work of God that will either happen now or at some point in the future. So I want you to think about David's anointing as king, which happened in 2 Samuel chapter 5. You could go there and find it. Samuel comes up. Remember the story? says, hey, I think God's led me to this family, um, the king's here, and it goes through all the really spectacular brothers, the big, tall brothers. There's, none of those are the ones that God has set apart. And eventually, he's like, hey, is there any more sons to this family? Because uh, God definitely told me to come and anoint a king here, but so far I haven't seen any kings. God has not told me that this is a king. And eventually they sort of go, oh, yeah, there is one more. Like, it's always the youngest, right? Oh, that's right, we do have another one somewhere. Um, He happens to be out in the field, he's looking after the, you know, the goats, the sheep, whatever, and they're like, well, get him in here, right? So it's David, the little shepherd boy, and God says, that's that's the one. That's, That's my man. And Samuel anoints him, pours oil on him, symbolically setting him apart, for some particular thing that God was going to do in and through David. He was also anointed with oil on a number of other occasions, David, including at his actual coronation as king, which happens in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, you can read about it. The distance of time between when he was anointed as a boy and when he was coronated as king is 15 years. So as a young shepherd boy, the oil goes on to him and and Samuel says, I'm setting you apart. God is setting you apart for a great work that he's going to do in you and through you. And nothing happens for 15 years. In fact, things do happen, but it actually just gets worse for David. When elders anoint the sick with oil, we are setting you apart with 
both symbolism and our requests through prayer for God to do what only God can do. It is an act of expectant faith to say, God, will you do something amazing? And symbolically, the anointing of oil is a is a way of showing that, of setting the person apart. All right, so that's verse 14. That's what you should expect. If you were sick and you called the elders to us, we would, we would come and we'd say, we want to pray with you and over you, and we would ask you, can we anoint you with oil? And that's, that's why we do it. This is what we expect, though. This is what we expect. Read with me from verse 15, James 5, verse 15. This is where it starts to become a little bit sort of like, oh, wow, this is hard, right? Because verse 15 says, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And that's hard, isn't it? We want to be excited about that verse. I really want to just go, wow, let's, man... Right? If I'm going to ever be tempted, and I'm not, if I'm ever going to be tempted to start preaching a health, wealth, and prosperity doctrine, it's because I would just read this verse over and over again. Because this starts to get me excited about the fact, right? The prayer of faith will save the one who's sick and the Lord will raise him up. Hallelujah, right? Except my experience has been that that doesn't always happen. Does that weaken our faith? Does that start to crumble our confidence in God or not? All right, this is part of the challenge, isn't it? We have to be honest with the text and we have to be honest with ourselves because although I have some ideas which I trust are shaped by the truth of God's word and his spirit, I have to admit to feeling a bit out of my depth here. Prayer is maybe the simplest and yet the most mysterious practice in our Christian walk. There are things about it which I feel like I understand, and yet there is so much that I feel like I don't understand about prayer. But here's how this works out in practice here. We pray in faith. We pray in faith. Whether that's as an eldership over someone sick or as a church as we gather together to pray for those amongst us who are sick and suffering, we pray in faith, and some are healed, and some are not. Now, there's a few ways that we can approach this verse in light of our experience. Our experience is we pray earnestly. We pray in faith. Some are healed. Others aren't. So scenario one in how we respond to that reality is that we can state that God does, in fact, heal all his children. Right? That's what that verse says says that he will heal them, he will raise them up. So we state that God does, in fact, heal all his children without exception. But, this is where we we try to help explain our experience against this verse, but some don't experience full healing until after the grave. And they receive new bodies in their new creation. There is no more tears, there's no more suffering. We love those verses, right? Now, I think that that is true, that all God's children will experience new bodies with all corruption and all mortality stripped away, and that the new heavens and new earth will be experienced in a fullness like we've never experienced before. However, while this is true, I'm not sure that this view takes in a plain reading of James 5.15. It seems James has a different expectation to this. James' context and how he's talking seems more immediate, more temporal than our sort of ways of explaining how some people don't seem to experience healing and then we think, well, it must mean that they're healed in fullness after death, Um, which which I believe is true, but, but it still doesn't seem to ring as true with what James is talking about right now. So scenario two is this. Um, We pray in faith, some people are healed, some people aren't, and we try and justify that or reconcile that with James 5, 15, James 5, 16, and we come up with this scenario, that some people believe that if healing is not experienced, 
then either the sick person had insufficient faith or that the people praying had insufficient faith. I don't believe that's true. More than that, I'd say that this belief is in fact dangerous to your faith. Firstly, the verse simply says that the prayer of faith, it doesn't say the prayer of much faith, or it doesn't say the prayer of exceptional faith. It simply says the prayer of faith. It simply means that a prayer offered to God in faith has been made. So what do we know of faith from the rest of Scripture? Faith, as flickering and as vulnerable as a mustard seed is in the wind, is still able to see mountains uprooted and thrown into the sea. That's what the Scripture says. Or when Jesus saw the faith of a centurion who said, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. The dead were brought back to life. This is the centurion who said, yeah, I believe, but Lord, help my unbelief. I I feel double-minded about this. I feel uncertain about this. There's doubt that still exists within me, and I'm praying, Lord, I believe that you can do this, but I, I don't know how, and I'm... Man, Jesus said that's the type of faith that he hadn't seen before in Israel, and, and, and the dead daughter was brought back to life. Or or when a desperate act of a woman who had tried everything else and Jesus was her absolute last resort, pushes through a crowd, reaches out and just touches the hem of his garment. Right? God's power stemmed the flow of blood that she had experienced for 12 years. And Jesus was her last resort. You see, the problem, as I see it, is that we must confuse sometimes faith with positive thinking. We think that faith equals positive thinking. Like, if I can just muster up enough positive energy and think good thoughts or repeat the the right life verse enough times, then God will answer my prayers. That's not what faith is. Faith doesn't mean positive thinking. Worse yet is when we begin confusing faith with authority. And we start claiming all sorts of things and then demand that God do do things for us. We think faith gives us the ability to demand God, to demand things of God. Let's get this really straight here. If you haven't heard me say this before, God is not your genie. He doesn't exist to hop to your beck and call, granting wishes. That's not what faith is and it's not what prayer is about. So this is not about, was there not enough faith present in this person who was sick? Or about, was there not enough faith or positive thinking by those who were doing the praying? So what's scenario three? Let me suggest a third way here. Even though I know it still holds a lot of mystery for me, and more mystery than sometimes, if I'm honest, that we're comfortable with. Scenario three is we pray for the sick. They're there. They've said, I'm sick and I'm suffering. And as God's family, whether elders or or others, we, we gather around them and we pray for the sick and we pray for them with utterly childish simplicity. We simply ask our Father to do something for us that we know is outside of our control. We ask, we don't demand, and we simply trust that whatever the Father gives is good and perfect. Even if we can't make sense of it this side of the grave. This is God's invitation Praying for the sick is God's invitation for us to relate to him as a good father who desires to give good things as we express our dependency on him. And yet, he never ceases to be the sovereign king of all time and space. 
God knows the end from the beginning. He holds the span of our days in his hand. Every minute accounted for in the mind of God from eternity past. And yet, he asks us to pray and implore him for those that we love who are sick. Right? It's a mystery. The sovereign God invites us to call him Abba, the most intimate form of father that we could think of, and ask things of him in the same way as a child might wake up in the night. I have some experience with this. Many of you do as well. A child wakes you up in the middle of the night. Daddy, they call out and you rouse from your sleep. You might feel frustrated. You might feel even annoyed. I I do on occasion. But as dad, you wander down the hallway, you stumble into things, you you think, oh, those kids didn't pick those toys up and now I've stood on them and all sorts of things. You wander down and you walk and you say, what's the matter, darling? What's... I'm thirsty. (laughs) Well, you know how to use a tap? Go and get it. No. (laughs) You go, okay, darling. And you go and fill up the cup cup, and you you give it to them to have a drink. You go, okay, okay, go back to sleep now. And you. But the audacity to wake dad up in the middle of the night and tell him that I'm thirsty. And when Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray, he uses analogies like that. He says, you who are evil, us fallen and failing fathers and mums, if we know how to get up and do that, even though we might be sort of, oh, I wish I could just go to sleep. and We have all sorts of problems and things that are going on, but we can still get up and, and look after our child in the middle of the night. And, and Jesus says, treat your father like that. We're in the middle of the night, you can call out, and he, he is there. And you can say, Dad, Daddy, will you, will you hear? What I, I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. I'm hurting. My friend is hurting. And he loves to hear his children call out. All right, let's go back to James 5.15 for a moment. The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. This just gets more and more challenging, right? So not only does this verse make us wrestle with the relationship between prayer and healing, it also adds to our uncertainty with this statement about the the sick person's sin and their forgiveness. So I just want to say a few quick things. I know we're running out of time. Um, I think they're important, though. Much more could be said, but, but we'd be here far too long. It would be wrong of us to ignore a connection between sin and sickness. James makes it. Uh, James hints at the connection here, but elsewhere the Bible is far more direct when it connects the two things, sin and sickness. All right, We clearly see that Scripture testifies that some sickness, even death, come upon believers as a result of God's fatherly discipline. Acts chapter 5 is the most scary passage We see the direct results of Ananias and Sapphira's deceit and sin against God, and we see it in their death. Can't ignore that. We shouldn't ignore that. Then later, in 1 Corinthians, Paul links sickness and even death with the sin in the church at Corinth in the way that they were meeting together to remember the Lord in communion. He says, that's why some of you are sick and some have even fallen asleep. A euphemism for death. Right? The, the church in Corinth had made a complete mess about what it means to be the church gathering together and remembering the Lord and sickness had come in and Paul says it was a direct result of their sin. Talk about that in a moment a bit more. But, but does that mean that all sickness is the result of sin? Like, if someone's sick here and they say, um, can the elders come and pray, that one of our things is that we walk in and say, well, all right, hang on. What have you done wrong? We'll pray in a moment, but first confess, right? Is anyone here sick or suffering? You know, we could start saying, well, there's, there's sin in your life and that's why you're sick. 
And that's garbage. Probably. The problem is, of course, that that it is a common complaint of humanity that we struggle to make sense of things that we don't have a clear cause and effect relationship with. This happened, and it's because that occurred. Think about Job for a moment. His whole life fell apart with disaster upon disaster, leading him to sit in grief and pain with blistering boils erupting all over his body, his wife standing beside him just saying, Job, just curse God and die. And then his three best friends arrive and basically say, well, Job, what did you do wrong? Just confess your sin and God will heal you. Job says, I haven't done anything wrong. I'm innocent. To which his friends reply, well, now you're just adding the sin of lying to whatever other sin you had already committed. You must have done some sort of terrible sin, confess it and find healing. That's what this whole conversation in Job's about. Or what about when the disciples were walking with Jesus that time and they passed by a beggar who had been born blind. They didn't care about him. They just wanted to do um, a little theological debating here with Jesus and use this guy as an object lesson. And so they ask him, John chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, as he was passing by, he saw a blind man who had been blind since birth and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Can you see the cause and effect relationship? Who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? We want a clear cause and effect relationship. But look at Jesus' response. Verse 3, John chapter 9 says this. Jesus answered, It was not this man who sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. All right, this might be a little bit of a con- confronting concept for us to try and deal with. It sort of disrupts our safe pictures of God that we've produced in our mind. But listen carefully to what Jesus is saying. This man was born blind, has lived his entire life blind with all the hardships and all the suffering that that brought him in order that the glorious wonder of God's power might be demonstrated through him. So at the very least, we can confidently say that his suffering had nothing to do with his sin. Most human sickness, while not outside of God's divine purpose, is simply the result of living in a broken world. Most But this doesn't mean that we dismiss sin or treat it casually, which leads us to our last little bit. I'm going to try and do this really quick. Um, Prayer, not in response to sickness, but now we're going to talk very quickly about prayer in response to sin. James 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. We're still talking about prayer here that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. All right, we talk a lot about confession, but usually we restrict our thinking to confession to God. Right? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we love that verse. Praise God, I love that verse. What enormous comfort to know that whatever sin you are experiencing, whatever battle that you're experiencing right now, that as we come to God in confession to him, he is faithful, he's just, he will forgive sin. That's our hope, and he forgives it in Christ, right? But here, James extends his theme on prayer by showing us how it relates to sin within the family of faith, the local church. James exhorts us to create a culture of confession. And not just confession to God. James says, confess your sins, your faults to who? One another. Now our confession has gone from being vertical to horizontal. Look at the relationship here between those who are doing the confession and those who are hearing the confession. 
Right? It's a powerful point that I want you to take note of. In my experience, both personally, that I've, as I've dealt with my own sin, and as I've dealt with seeing sin in the lives of others, the two most influential reasons people don't confess sin to other people is this. First reason is, they don't think that they need to confess. Right? They don't own their sin. Right? That's a reason why they don't confess sin, because they just go, well, I didn't do anything wrong. That's another whole thing on its own. We're not going to talk about that. We want to talk about the second reason, though. The reason why people often don't confess their sins to other people is that they don't think that it is safe to confess their sins to other people. They don't think it's safe to talk with another person and let them know about their sin. And it's this second reason I want you to consider for a moment. Our world that we live in right now is infatuated with a cancel culture. Right? The mighty are falling all around us, and we've built an environment that revels, that, that even celebrates their failure. There's nothing greater that we love than to read about the failings of our famous people. Oh, the, the, the news goes nuts about it. We all go nuts about it. It fills our feeds. We love it. That's the sort of environment that we're building. But in contrast, look at the culture that James is asking us to develop. A culture where sinners feel safe to repent. I don't want you to mishear me. I didn't say a culture that is okay with sin. But a culture where sin is owned. A culture where sin isn't hidden but instead drives people to long for restoration with God and others, where repenting sinners are met with those who genuinely desire their healing and are willing to walk with them towards healing in prayer. A place where wanderers find brothers and sisters who gently come alongside them and point them back to the God of grace and truth. Right. When this is the sort of prayer-infused culture that shapes the fabric of our church, powerful things begin to happen. The prayer of a righteous person has great power when it's working, James says. And you might be saying, well, there it is, Chris, right? There's the reason why some of our prayers don't seem to work. Powerful prayer gets results when righteous people pray. There, it says it right there. And James knows that you're going to say that. And so he tells us about Elijah. It's there in the passage. We won't read it again. He says, Elijah was a man just like us. He wasn't some superhuman person. He wasn't some higher form of human or an elite prayer warrior. Elijah wasn't someone who'd upgraded their prayer closet to a prayer fortress. Right? Elijah was plagued with doubt. If you read Elijah's story, Elijah was plagued with doubt. Elijah suffered with suicidal episodes of depression. Elijah was hated by the people who God called him to minister to and lived for long periods of his life hiding because he had a death warrant commissioned by the royal family. The point is, you don't have to be spectacular to have a powerful prayer life. You just have to have the simple childlike faith that God will show up. That God doesn't require spectacular people to do spectacular things. Right? That sometimes our prayers won't be answered the way that we'd like them to be, but God is a God who still does miracles. Our prayers reflect that we believe that God still heals. And God is a God who still redeems the broken and the wandering. So let's pray. Let's pray with a posture of focused attention on God. Are you hurting this morning? Pray. Are you cheerful? Praise. Right? Let's pray humbly but confidently for those around us who are experiencing sickness. And let's build a culture of walking with sinners 
in prayer. So that when someone comes to you and confesses sin, they will be met with a brother or a sister who loves them genuinely and can look them in the eye and say, Jesus died to pay the penalty for that sin. You can know his full acceptance and embrace. Let me pray with you that you will not fall into the trap of that sin again. There's a lot more to be said about prayer. Our time is well and truly up. Thanks for being patient with me. Let's pray together now, though. Will you stand as we pray? Lord Jesus, we want to be a church where that culture of prayer exists, where our prayer is about an outward focus on who you are, whether it's in our suffering or in our joy, that all our focus and all our attention would be towards you. Lord, we want to we be a church that loves sincerely those who are suffering amongst us, those who are sick amongst us. And even right now, we know of people amongst our church going through great challenges. And as a church right now, we add our amen and we simply just say, Father, we love them. Will you heal them? We ask you, Lord, to do what we can't. Will you place your powerful hand on their life and restore and bring health to them for your glory? And Lord, where there's sin amongst us, we ask that you would give us a culture, that you would help us shape a culture where we're not okay with sin, but nor do we celebrate it. Lord, that we want to be a, a place where sin can be brought to light before you and before each other and know that we will have brothers and sisters who are willing to pray with us and to walk with us through the challenges of, the, of living out our faith in this hard and sinful world. Lord, help us, we pray. We need your help. Spirit, strengthen us for this task. In Jesus' name, amen.